Hello everyone, and today I'm very, very honoured to be joined by Lord Christopher Monckton, the third Viscount Monckton of Brenchley. Um, so Christopher is a prominent British public speaker and is known for his work as a journalist, a conservative political advisor under Maggie Thatcher, a UKIP political candidate, and for his invention of the mathematical puzzle um, Eternity, which I've never played, unfortunately. I'm not that clever. Um, Christopher's public speaking has garnered a lot of worldwide attention due to his interesting and controversial take on climate change and for his strong views on the European Union and various social policies. Um, climate change is what Christopher is most well known for of late. And since 2008, he's toured the world extensively from Australia to the USA, all over Europe and even to India and China, delivering talks to universities, TV networks, the media, town hall meetings, you name it, even giving your opinions before the American Congress on a good few occasions, which is very impressive. So Christopher, it's a real pleasure to have you chat with me today on my little old channel. Thank you very much. Well, it's an enormous pleasure to be with you, and we're going to be covering a lot of ground. <laughs> okay, that's grand. I, I, as long as you don't mind hanging around that long. Um, so, as we, so today we'll be talking about some of the issues surrounding specifically wind turbines, um, how completely ineffective they are, how in times of need they just seem to collapse and stall, and we've seen that most recently in Texas and also in Germany, and we'll chat about that too in those places. And then we'll probably have some general thoughts on the climate change story and the green energy sham. Um, if we could talk about maybe the two examples I said, Texas and Germany, because I think that was really uh, a wake-up call. And it, it kind of shows exactly how bad the, the wind turbines can be. And when they're needed, they weren't there. It's actually quite helpful to, yeah. to focus on this by pointing out that in both Texas and Germany, there's one single outstanding fact from both of these substantial and deadly outages is that the electricity corporations in, and, and grid management corporations in both places had reduced the amount of uh, real, continuous, reliable, affordable power from uh, coal and gas chiefly and mm -hmm. a little bit of nuclear mm -hmm. and uh, in return for that they had put windmills and solar panels onto the grid. Uh, windmills mm -hmm. of course are 14th century technology to solve a 21st century non-problem and the result of that was that when they had a big code snap because global warming isn't quite what it's cracked up to be, and we're, why that's the case we'll talk about later, um, they were unable to cope because the wind didn't blow, and even if it did, the turbines got ice on their blades, and so they stopped working. And there was one fatal moment in Texas when practically no wind or solar energy was being contributed to the grid, but because they had cut four gigawatts of power out of just one state's permanent electricity supply. The permanent electricity supply, part of which also failed, was mm -hmm. then unable to maintain power. If they had kept the additional four gigawatts that they cut out because they thought they could, when in fact they couldn't, mm -hmm. there wouldn't have been any blackouts in Texas. Yeah. So I give you that background because okay. that is the reason why windmills are so disproportionately costly. Yeah. It is because they are inevitably an addition to and not a replacement for the entire existing grid. You can't take any of the existing grid of permanent reliable power away if you put windmills and solar panels on for the obvious reason that solar panels, they still haven't designed them so that they work at night. And the windmills, they still haven't designed them so that they turn when the wind isn't blowing, except that in many places, to stop them seizing up altogether during long periods with no wind, they actually take power from the grid to drive them and are paid by us, the electricity users, to do so. So these are the inherent problems. It's, a, it's an absolutely fatal flaw with so-called renewable electricity. 
yeah. uh, or it really be called unreliables rather than renewables because they're intermittent, they're unreliable, they have a very short shelf life as well. So that's the context. And I told you yeah. I'd be brief about that, and we can yeah. expand on some. Because that that's that is part of what you said is part is part is true. I mean, for example, I think in, in Germany this. The, wind, the windmills lie idle for nearly 60 days of the year and that has to be that energy you, you know as you said if there has to be a backup and then if you get rid of the backup which is going to be coal or nuclear you know what are you left yes. with <laughs> Anything these days. Um, then it all stops and th this is a huge problem which in particular the texas thing has pointed out because texas unlike germany is not interconnected to the united states grid as germany is to europe mm. uh, it's largely an isolated system so a great debate the economics behind windmills and i'll leave a description i'll leave a link in the description box below uh, where you talk about the economics behind wind turbines and the problems behind them what are the main issues and problems with wind turbines the first thing that stands out is their staggering, stupefying cost. Even if you put them offshore where you haven't got the problem of paying for the land or paying rent to the farmer or the landowner, you still have the enormous problems of the cost of installation. And you have, particularly offshore, a very heavy maintenance cost to keep them working because the ocean is an extremely inhospitable place for these devices. You have the enormous risk of killing birds, bats and bees, incidentally, which has uh, recently become a very important consideration. But the cost of doing all this, even taking the very latest bids for the British round of the next lot of our shoreline, which will be wrecked by views out to sea of these monstrous turbines higher than Salisbury Cathedral, the tallest cathedral in Europe. Um, these things, uh, you know, they look terrible, they sound terrible, but they are wickedly, wickedly costly. The latest round of bids, they are three times to four times the cost of coal as measured by levelized cost, that's including the cost of uh, installation, but not yet with wind farms, the cost of decommissioning, mm. uh, because they have a very short life cycle. They were supposed to last 25 years, but they don't. They last a maximum of 10 years before they begin to lose their effectiveness. So they're very expensive, at least three times, probably more like four or five times the cost of and we're not talking three to five percent, we're talking three to five hundred percent, or to, to be correct, two to four hundred percent. Very, very large cost premium that has to be met. And for what purpose? So that's the first thing, huge cost. Then we come on to the design. And the design is subject to a fundamental limit on the amount of power you can get out of these things. And that limit is called the Betts limit after the guy who first worked it out. And it means you can only get a very small proportion of the theoretical power that you should be able to extract from the swept area of each turbine. So to overcome this, of course, they make the turbines absurdly big. But the problem with having horizontal axis turbines, which is what they univer near universally use, is that the wind flow, particularly with these big turbines and particularly with the offshore turbines, is laminar. It goes in layers and the further up you go, the faster the wind. And the problem with that is that if you have a very large swept area, and so large is the swept area of a typical turbine these days that its blade will be traveling at 666 kilometers an hour. Uh, so they're very, very big. Uh, indeed, the swept area, if you were to stand it upright, would, would overtop Salisbury Cathedral. You're going to get differential stresses. You're going to get much more stress on the blade that happens to be uppermost than on the blade that's lowermost. And the problem with that is twofold. One, it imposes a terrific asymmetric loading on the bearings, and they still haven't learned to install syringes.
ceramic bearings rather than metal ones. Ceramic ones might be able to withstand this better. Um, but also this asymmetric loading makes a noise so that if you were to have these things on land, nobody can live near that without going nuts. And this, this disease that goes with wind turbines, which the turbine manufacturers did their best to deny for a decade or two, now it's well recognized. And so local communities, if you say, oh, we're going to offer you nice, clean, free energy from windmills, they say, run along, mate, we don't want to have it. So we have won the battle on land-based turbines, I think, in, in uh, most of Europe now, certainly in Britain, they are deeply, deeply unpopular, which is why Boris Johnson who is a socialist at heart and has a, therefore a socialist fascination for grand projects that somebody else other than him has to pay for, uh, is very keen on these vast offshore wind farms, which however are even more costly than the ones on land. So that doesn't work either. But there's a further problem with uh, wind turbines, which is that these really big ones, because they interfere with the laminar flow, particularly when a rainstorm is passing, one of the things you get, the more of these wind turbines you put round your coasts, the more when a rainstorm comes, it will, instead of passing straight over, in our case, it comes from you in Ireland, it crosses us and then dumps the rain on Europe. What we are now getting is the rainstorms are stopping with us, sometimes for days at a time, which they never did before. And one reason for this, it's got nothing to do with global warming, it's got everything to do with the interference with the laminar flow that allows these star storms normally to pass over fairly freely. Yes, they, they run over mountains, but mountains on the whole in Britain have fairly rounded tops. They don't, propose, they don't pose much of a, an obstacle to the wind. Whereas these damn turbines, they really do interfere with the rate at which storms can get past us. And we are noticing an increase in flooding. Now, to be fair, one of the things you'd expect with slightly warmer weather, and that's all we've really had, it's about a degree Celsius over the last 170 years, um, is you will get a little bit more water vapor in the atmosphere, which will have to precipitate out eventually. So you'd expect a little bit more rainfall, and sure enough, the area of the Earth under drought, according to the most detailed survey ever done, which was in 2014 by Howe et al., uh, has been declining. And the Sahara, according to a very recent report, has actually greened to an, to an extent of 700,000 square kilometers in the past 20 years. And even as early as 1981, it was being reported that already 300,000 km square kilometers, in addition, had greened. And so these benefits of global warming are simply not mentioned or accounted for when Joe Biden, for instance, produce, reproduces the Obama social cost of carbon. They never count the benefit in continuous electricity that doesn't kill you every time a cold snap comes over. So windmills then are, as I've said, 14th century technology intended to address a 21st century non-problem. They don't work very well. They are very expensive. They are intermittent. This is another huge problem. If, if the wind isn't blowing, you don't get any electricity from them. Indeed, in order to stop them seizing up, uh, they often drain the power from the, grid and, uh, from the grid and often have to do this in peak periods in order to keep the system from seizing up altogether. And another absurdity with wind, I mean, you couldn't make this up. There are so many absurdities. Yeah. Uh, but another absurdity is that the power um, 
is not available when you want it. And therefore, you have to maintain what is called spinning reserve. And spinning reserve in the coal-fired and gas-fired power stations means they have to be kept turning over all the time, even when you're taking most of your power from the wind. Because if at any moment the wind suddenly stops, and it can stop very suddenly, you have to be able to kick in full power from your reliables, because your unreliables are unreliable. Mm. And that means you have to run the turbines, the gas turbines and the steam turbines with the coal-fired power at spinning reserve, which is hugely inefficient. And it emits very nearly as much CO2 as if you were running the whole system at full chat. And Professor Hughes of Edinburgh University, who's the expert on this, has actually worked out, he's done this several times and nobody has been able to challenge him at all seriously. He's worked out that the, the real problem with windmills, if, you're, if your desire is to get a large amount of your electricity from them and thereby to reduce your carbon footprint, is that they do the reverse. They, in net terms, their levelized emissions cost is greater than that of a coal-fired power station, which is saying quite a lot. And the reason is a combination of this spinning reserve at the coal-fired power station that has to be kept there in case the wind dies. And you can ask the Texans how necessary that is. They now understand that. And uh, at the same time, the delivery of power when it does come is very small. And that leads on to another problem with, with wind turbines, and this also applies to solar panels, which is low energy density. And that is inversely proportional to the environmental damage, the environmental cost. The less energy you get out per square kilometer of solar panels or wind farms, you know, the less energy you get out, you get very, very little out, the heavier the environmental cost. I'll give you just one example of this. A very rare bird flew over Scotland uh, about half a dozen years ago. Terrible excitement. All the twitchers were out there rushing to go and get photographs of it. And sure enough, what did it do? It ran into one of these huge wind turbines. It spat it out of the sky and it killed. Yeah. And so the, the environmental cost of these things is enormous. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it cannot be underestimated. The, not only the landscape damage and now the seascape damage, which is tremendous, the environmental cost of living near them and getting this wind turbine illness, which has been widely reported and well studied now, they know why it happens and there's nothing they can do about it because of this asymmetric loading I was talking about earlier. So for all these reasons, windmills as a rational solution to this non-problem simply don't work. In fact, they make the non-problem worse or from my point of view, they make it better because they are encouraging the coal-fired and, uh, and gas-fired power stations to be turning over at spinning reserve, emitting more CO2 than the whole system would have done <laughs> left on its own. And therefore, that well, helped well, to grease. Was that the plan? Was, Maybe that was the plan. <laughs> the cunning plan. It's a very, very expensive way to do it. Um, no, it makes no sense uh, on any level. I mean, anyone who stood back and said, what is the rational solution, even if there were a problem, they wouldn't do it that way. It's just not at all sensible. And it yeah. is quite astonishing that because the news media have now been captured by, and I'm going to call them climate communists, because that's essentially... <laughs> yeah, they are people who government projects. Want, yeah. They simply want to follow the party line regardless. And whether they call themselves communist or not, it's that method of thinking, that totalitarian method of thinking where nobody else is allowed to get a view. You know, mm -hmm. And you can't tell them, actually, there isn't a problem anyway. It's all the result of an error of physics. Or the windmills don't make sense because they cost too much and they actually add to what you think is the problem. They won't allow any of this to be said. There's yeah. been a complete blackout. Now, if 
I were simply some kind of conspiracy theorist who was saying this whole global warming scam is a plot by the communist left to destroy the West and end capitalism. Well, there are certainly elements of that in it. If you talk to uh, my good friend Patrick Moore, the founder of Greenpeace, along with a group of his friends, and they all had to leave when the communists moved in and took it over. And he's very clear about it. He said Greenpeace is simply as most of these environmental movements now are, a communist front shilling for Russia and China. Russia, which has been selling its Siberian natural gas into Europe at anything up to four times the world price, because mm. the commissars that run Europe, the unelected commissars, thank heaven that they no longer govern us, um, they still govern you. I mean, I've never understood why the Irish free state should have <laughs> subjected it to the European tyranny by Clark. I suppose you're attracted by the money that they hand out to get you to join. And then once you're in, they start wanting it all back. And now you're net contributors. It's not so funny. And people are beginning to say, let's have an IREX it. And so they should. But of course, one of the interesting things about this global warming debate is how all these supranational organizations like the commissars of the EU, who nobody elects, and they, they act just like the commissars of the Soviet Union. They issue edicts, and everybody has to obey. Uh, that's, what, that's the main reason why I wanted out. When I discovered that they could issue a thing called a commission regulation, which has the immediate force of supreme law throughout the European Union, and no parliament, including the European Parliament, has any say in the matter. I realized that we'd gone from democracy to dictatorship, and we weren't having that in Britain, mm -hmm. or at least more than half of us weren't, and so we left. But that's, that's a side issue. But the, what is interesting is that all these supranational organizations that aren't democratic and therefore cannot appeal to any legitimacy granted to them by election are always trying to find ways of justifying their continued and ever more expensive existence. The EU is a typical example of this. The UN is another. So the moment this climate change thing came along, pushed as it was originally and still is now by communists from Russia and China uh, who are paying these environmental groups enormous sums to keep this going so that they shut down the Western industries because we can't afford the, to, to pay the cost of windmills. It's far cheaper to have coal-fired power. I mean, you can get coal-fired power at around 25 euros a megawatt hour. You're looking at 150 euros a megawatt hour for your typical wind turbine. So you can see the damage that does because we're having to pay this monstrous premium on all our electricity bills. And the reason for that is that, that means that in Russia and China, where electricity is a tiny fraction of the cost that it is in the West, solely because the West is piling these uh, ludicrous global warming policies on and running windmills and solar panels. Um, this means that all our large businesses, our motor manufacturing, our steel manufacturing, our aluminium smelters, are all having to go to Russia and China because they simply can't afford any longer the price of electricity in, for instance, Britain. Mm. I mean, this is a huge strategic threat to Western jobs and businesses. I've, I'm astonished that, for instance, in Britain, the Trade Union Congress has not yet realized that it is damaging its own workers' jobs directly by countenancing this global warming gibberish. Well, <laughs> trade unions these days, that's not going to happen. <laughs> well, you know? the truth is that they too, you see, they were founded largely by communists, they were certainly funded by communists, and the communists have always gone after energy. If we go back into the history of this, I was brought into number 10, ostensibly as a member of the policy unit, because it was necessary to make sure that we defeated the communists who were running the National Union of Mine Workers during the mine workers' strike. Now, I have a soft spot for mine workers. I once went down the smartest mine in Yorkshire, which was Kellingley, to have a look, and was utterly horrified by the conditions. I mean, I, um, I went down the mine and was so horrified by the dust and the stink and the cramped conditions that I thought, you know, whatever money you pay people to do this job, it isn't enough. 
And indeed, that was the line I took with Margaret Thatcher. I said, actually, if it's a question of paying the miners a bit more, I think you know you shouldn't jib at that. And she didn't. She was willing to pay them more. But the miners' strike wasn't about pay. It was it was funded and organised from Moscow, because the Russians wanted to damage the capitalist West by hitting it where they knew it would hurt most, which is in our energy supply. Mm. So they, they sent something like 20 million sterling, which was a lot of money in those days, about 100 million today, to the uh, mine workers via the Czech embassy, which of course was a communist country in those days. Uh, and they thought that if they sent it that way, we wouldn't spot it, but we did. And that was what we did spot. We don't know how much they put in that we didn't spot. Um, and Scargill, who was the leader of the mine workers, whom I knew because I had gone drinking with him in Leeds you know, years previously. Uh, and he was very personable, very clubbable, kind of jolly, hail fellow, well met kind of guy. But he was an out and out communist. He made no secret of the fact that he was taking his orders from Moscow. And he, in fact, had gone to Moscow. Uh, on the 28th of July, 1978, that was just about uh, almost a year before Margaret Thatcher took office. And he had sailed from the port of Tilbury on a Polish freighter where he hoped nobody was watching, but of course we were. And he landed at what was then Leningrad and is now once again St. Petersburg. And he took, just as Lenin before him, a sealed train to Moscow where he was met by his communist handlers. And he was taken initially to the Patrice Lumumba University of Terrorism, where all the terrorist grunts were trained. And he spent just three weeks there. And they realized, as had I, because I knew him quite well, that he was much brighter than your average terrorist grunt, than your average communist. He was really far too bright to be a communist. He ought to have known better. But anyway, he then was transferred to the Lenin Institute, which was where they trained not the grunts, but the terrorist leaders. Yasser Arafat was trained there. Jerry Adams was trained there. All the serious terrorist leaders were trained at the Lenin <laughs> Institute. <laughs> okay. He then spent five months there. Then he got an Aeroflop plane from Moscow to Paris, because he certainly didn't want to be seen landing at Heathrow on a Russian plane. People would have joined the dots, didn't realize that we'd been following him all the way there at both institutes and all the way back again. And so he then transferred to a British Airways flight and landed at Heathrow as though he'd been off on holiday somewhere. Mm. And uh, we noted all this and kept it on file because we realized that he'd probably been there to be trained so as to set up a, a minor strike the next time there was a conservative government because the uh, Socialist Party in Britain at that time was more or less wholly controlled by communists. So they, uh, they, the communists would never strike against a, a Labour government. So sure enough, along came Margaret Thatcher and within a couple of years of her taking office, uh, the miners were busy preparing for the strike. Not mm -hmm. realised we knew exactly what their preparations were going to entail. And we were completely, completely ready for them because mm -hmm. a committee set up by Margaret Thatcher even before she became leader of the party under the cleverest mind in her cabinet, which was the late Nicky Ridley, was a wonderful, very nice guy. That committee had worked out exactly how to defeat any strike. Mm. And they realized that the miners would get in touch with communists in the other unions, particularly the transport unions and the dockers unions, and, and say, come on, brothers, in solidarity, uh, let's bring down capitalism together and don't let any coal in through the ports. But there was one private port that was Felix Stowe. So very quietly, under the noses of the then, the then Labour government, Felix Stowe was re-engineered and repurposed so you could ship in any amount of coal that you wanted through there. And the union in the docks was got rid of. And so it was the one uh, union free dock. Mm. So get as much coal in through there as we wanted. And all this was thought out mm. by Nicky. But we also had to try to maintain, and this comes back to our original discussion about <laughs> you know, electricity, where do you get it from? <laughs> we had to make sure we could maintain 
sufficient electrical power to keep the grid running, even if several of the coal-fired power stations were successfully taken offline by Scargill and his miners picketing and using mm -hmm. violence and throwing stones, and they even killed one or two people. Um, you know, they were very violent, they were very determined. And so what then happened was that, uh, again, entirely, while the Conservatives were in opposition, it was a very, very effective party under Margaret Thatcher, they managed to persuade the Central Electricity Generating Board, on which they had some friends, to install a load equalisation station in a mountain in Wales. There were two possible sites. One was at Ben Cruiken in Scotland and the other was at uh, De Norwig in Wales. And in the end, we plumped for De Norwig because it was very close to the SAS lines at Hereford. Mm. And that meant that if eventually communist saboteurs worked out that this load equalisation station would render any minor strike ineffective, uh, and they tried to get near it to disrupt it, they wouldn't get near it because it was surrounded by soldiers apparently on exercise. So we did that, and that came on stream right in the middle of the miners' strike. Okay. And just for the winter when they'd hoped that they would mm -hmm. be shut off the grid and so forth, they said what Heath had had to do. But one of the smartest things that Nicky Ridley did was to conceal from the communists the fact that this thing was of strategic importance. And his brilliant masterstroke, which the committee were, were absolutely overawed by, and of course enthusiastic to support it, um, was to advertise it. So there were pictures of it being built at night. It was not quite said where it was, but it was explained what it was. We're building this station that will level off the grid and make your power cheaper and make it work better. And they had this really sickening jingle which somebody thought up. Uh, for the Central Electricity Generating Board, we have the power to help you. It was a really ghastly jingle, but that had the effect. The KGB used to go to the yeah. cinema like everybody else, and that's where these, these adverts for this thing were appeared. And so they will have reported back to Moscow, nothing to see here, they're advertising it, so it can't be of any great importance mm -hmm. strategically. And so we completely fooled them, and they never realised its importance. Yeah. And Scar was was making speeches saying the coal's running out, which it was. But of course, we could always bring more in if we needed it. But we knew we didn't need it because we had De Norwig, because the big problem of the grid at that time was very heavily coal dependent, about 70% coal, was that it, at peak times, and the peak time was always in the middle of Coronation Street during the ad break when uh, old Mrs. <laughs> 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 yes. would rush out and put her kettle on. Um, and so the result of this was that you had to, you got a huge spike and as Texas has recently discovered, if you let that happen, mm. then you can start knocking whole power stations off the grid because they have to maintain in phase <clears throat> with the grid, even when the demand is changing. It's, it's, it's a constant battle to mm. keep the thing in balance. This is uh, one of the disadvantages, the few disadvantages of uh, alternating current rather than direct current. So they had to keep this balance. And this is where the load equalization station came in because there's a lot of water all stored on top of a mountain in a vast great reservoir with a huge turbine in the middle of the mountain. And all you had to do was press a button when Mrs. Clackett put her kettle on and the water would rush down the mountain, spin up the turbine within half a second and it would be pumping electricity back into the grid to equalize the, the load. And that meant you didn't have to have dozens of little terribly old, smelly, dangerous co-fired power stations running at full chat or at spinning reserve all the time, just in case mm. there was going to be this, this spike in the load. So that was, and you know, Nicky Ridley was very clever. He worked all this out with mm. the CEB, persuaded them to put De Norwig in, and that effectively broke the strike. Once that was on stream, um, I was then able to brief journalists on it. All they really wanted to know at that time was quite close to what they Thursday was uh, why uh, w were the government doing so little to stop Scargill from winning the mm. strike. So I told them just a little of this. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other thing we had to do was to keep the miners themselves on site because there was a clear division here. We were not against, far from it, we were for the miners. We were against their communist leadership. 
Mm. And I remember I once had to call in a group of right wing MPs who were being difficult and threatening to make speeches against the miners. I said, I beg you, don't do that. In loyalty to their union, they feel they have to support it. They're not communists. There's no more loyal uh, Britain than you ever find. No more loyal subject of imagination than your typical miner. But they're also loyal to their union, and that was what the communists exploited. Mm. It was quite vicious how they exploited the miners in that way. One of the things we did to, to make sure that the miners were kept on side was to let them know that Scargill had been trained in Moscow. Mm. The way we did that was to brief a not particularly spectacular, not particularly well-known journalist who wrote rather dull columns for the time. And so he wrote a piece for us, which was run on an inside page. We didn't make a big thing of it. That was the whole point. It just ran a little column down the inside page. It was all broadsheet at the times in those days, explaining exactly what I've explained to you, the history of Scargill being trained in Moscow. And my job was to make sure the miners got to hear of this. So I recruited a friend of the prime minister's and of mine, who was a property spiff. He had an enormous um, empire of... of buildings, uh, including, for instance, a British Rail Office building in Crewe, which he had bought and leased back to them in such a way that uh, he ended up with a free building after 15 years. It was a very clever deal. Yeah, that was what he was like. He was very ingenious. So I said to him, I want you to stop spiffing. You can afford to. And for the next six months, I want you to do nothing except drive round all the pits, here is the cutting from the Times, and I want you to give the miners this cutting. So he immediately, because he, he was quite streetwise, said, why didn't you put this story in the Daily Mirror, where which all the miners read? I said, because if I put it in the Daily Mirror, they wouldn't believe it, because the, the miners aren't stupid enough to believe what the Daily Mirror writes. But they will believe what the Times writes, and if you give them this cutting, they'll read that all right. And that's your job. That's why we need you to do this. We had to put it in the Times because there it would gain enough credibility for this to work. But you have to go around and actually give it to them and talk to them because he was one of the very few people in the Tory party that could actually talk the language of working people. An awful lot of them couldn't. But he could. So off he went and he got down off his tractor where he'd been mowing the vast front lawn in front of his Elizabethan mansion in Suffolk and um, got into the murk he'd just bought. And in the rest of that year, he did 29,000 miles visiting every pit in Britain. He then set up at his own expense the National Working Miners Committee. And that committee was what brought the strike down. Mm. They identified that Leicestershire was the place where the miners were least happy. We only had to get them to, to, to break in one place and all the others would then collapse as well. Mm. And Leicestershire was the one. And he funded an enormously expensive campaign of advertisements in the newspapers uh, saying, come on, Arthur, give a ballot, asking Arthur Scargill to give the miners a vote on whether this strike should continue. And eventually he had to give them a vote and they voted to go back to work. Mm. So that was how the strike, uh, the strike was broken, essentially by this wonderful man. David Hart was his name. He's now merry in heaven. But uh, he was the one who, without any recognition or thanks, uh, saved us from communism then. Now, why do I tell that story in the context? Of well, I, I, just to, I, just, no, I just wanted to make two small points, um, yeah. if you don't mind. Like, I was talking to uh, Sebastian Ross. He's a part of a libertarian grouping in Poland and he yeah. was saying something similar with the solidarity guys um, in their coal mines at Gdansk they were all funded by uh, um, by Russia so essentially they were Russian agents even yeah. um, Lesh uh, what's what's his name Lesh what what's Lesh his name? Yes. yeah Lesh Wawenska and I mean and, and of course that's Lesh Lesh and not Lesh <laughs> so it's it's a similar story there and um I was also thinking that nowadays they don't they don't go for the bottom rug they go straight to the top you know the 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 the, the they go to the um, politicians and people in power they don't have to mess this around with the unions this anymore absolute. you know because they failed with the working classes and mm. they and it was actually the, the the British miners' strike where they realised that they'd lost the working classes and so the communists realised 
that working through um, ordinary workers who tended to have a loyalty to their country, which when push came to shove, they would always put first. They had to find other ways of doing it. And so that's where the shift came after the British miners' strike, which caused real ructions in Moscow. It was one of the things that eventually brought the regime down there. It was a big failure, a really big failure, because they'd been preparing for it for decades. And, you know, this committee under Nicky Ridley just ran rings around them. But um, the, the significance of this is that it does show, like it or not, that there is a communist input into mm. this global warming storyline. And it is the far left. You look at the, you know, the Democrats, so-called, it's a mm. terrible misnomer, under Joe Biden and uh, particularly Kamala Harris, who is... Which, 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 it, which in, incidentally, I, I think uh, this showed that two-thirds of Joe Biden's picks are directly or indirectly funded from China with various projects, you know? I mean... This, this, is, this is absolutely uh, another problem because when, China, when Russia was knocked off the board for a bit, and we'll come back to that in a moment, then the Chinese communists began to play to their advantage. Now, the particular advantage that East Asian populations have as a race, and I'm talking racially, not racialistically, but racially now, mm -hmm is that their average intelligence is one standard deviation greater than our own. Now, the Chinese are one standard deviation more intelligent than us. And under Mao Zedong, who was a kind of peasant, really, who just happened to find himself in the right place at the right time, he suppressed the intellectual class, because he was frightened that they would represent a challenge to his rule. And so anyone who was any sort of professor or wore spectacles or was in the least bit clever or could recite poetry or anything like that, they were sent to labor camps and dig farms and be re-educated, just as the Muslim Uyghurs and the, and the Tibetans are now. So that was how it was operated. And because they suppressed intellectualism, China became an even more backward country than it had been before the revolution. And therefore, this colossal competitive advantage that they have over us, which is their one standard deviation, brighter than us. And to give this, that now that the Chinese, under um, its present leadership, uh, are much more aware of this advantage, this intellectual advantage, they are putting money in to, exactly as you say, the Democrats in, in um, America, which they practically control now, uh, into the Labour Party in this country via the Momentum organization. The, uh, you know, they're doing this all over the place. They're in the universities. They've bought and paid for Jesus College Cambridge, for instance, where there's a fascinating committee, which they instigated, called the Legacy of Slavery Committee, which is busily looking at all the money that came to the college from people who had had some sort of interest in slave owning in the past, and saying, oh, we mustn't have this anymore. They won't quite give the money back or anything, but they will repudiate it. Um, uh, but it's called the Legacy of Slavery Committee because they don't want anyone saying, but what about the real slavery in occupied Tibet, which they have no right to occupy at all. But they've been there since 1949. Uh, and uh, in in uh, Sinkayang, where they, they, they have all the, the Uyghurs, somewhere between one and three million of them are imprisoned there in re-education camps. Um, and, of course, the Western communists don't bat an eyelid at this well, because well, just Chris, as they didn't, the, the, the camps under um, the Russians. But Christopher, don't you think that they might have a huge... I mean, I lived in China for six years, so I have, I, I'd like to think I have a little bit of uh, an idea. yeah. yeah what's the lay of the land there but yes oh. they're very, extremely high high iq but the problem is that they're they're communists and with the problem with communists is it's all, all follow the leader centralized there's no independent thought out of that so that's exactly that's, that's the edge that's xi jinping he's much cleverer than he looks he sounds like a thug and he acts like a thug yeah. but there's an intelligence there which we underestimate at our peril well, what he have, did you have to get to be a uh, nation as China, you have to be clever. <laughs> what he did 
or ruthless. He uh, decided that they knew perfectly well by then, they're bright enough to know this, they knew perfectly well that capitalism works. Mm. And the trouble with capitalism is that it is a diffusion of power and they wanted a concentration of power. Mm. So they looked around for totalitarian systems that appeared to be capitalist but also totalitarian. And you can imagine at once what that was, fascism. Mm. So what they've done is to blend communism and fascism in a single system. Mm. So they allow corporations to exist independently of and not owned by the state, provided that those corporations, just like Krupp uh, under the Nazis, mm -hmm. were willing to defer to the ruling power and do what it told them. And so you have effectively a fascist economic system and a communist political system combined so that China, I mean, I don't know when you were last in, <laughs> but the rate at which it is industrializing and electrifying itself, etc., et is, is staggering. I mean, yeah. really is large happening because of this freeing up of mm. the economic system so that a very large part of it is now um, liberated in the economic sense. It still, of course, has to be deferential in the political sense, but it's mm. liberated in the economic sense. Mm. And it's rather interesting because I had always thought that under a, a fiercely totalitarian system, capitalism of any sort couldn't thrive, but fascism can. And that's what they've done. And it's very clever and they are therefore growing very rapidly. They've also uh, understood far better than even the Russians did, and they were pretty good at it, how the Western financial system and the stock markets work. Mm. Just as it was the Russians who invented the euro bond, for instance, they invented the euro bond market for their own purposes. So the Chinese are all over the financial markets and they're doing <laughs> things there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one should not underestimate the enemy and one should not underestimate the fact that they actually are the enemy. Yeah, they, they do quite well they at the moment. <laughs> um, they don't like uh, liberty, they don't like freedom, they realise that democracy is, is a very, very attractive system to ordinary yeah. people. But it's hard so to... They're, it's, they're, it's just, hard. they're just as desperate as the Russians were to uh, make their people prosperous, but much more successful at it. Of course, they're still uh, a long way behind us, let's not be uh, too going overboard here. They are a long way behind us, but they are catching up at a quite astonishing rate of knots. Not uh, not least because all our heavy industries, as I've said earlier, are being transferred to China, uh, some of them to India, but most of them to China, yeah. because they can't afford to pay the electricity cost here, or the labour cost for that matter. Uh, yeah. And it's that double whammy of labour costs, government regulatory, it's a triple whammy, labour costs, re government regulatory costs, and electricity costs. Mm. Those are the three biggest costs in order that any business faces. And if, and now that we've made even the third one, the electricity cost, six times what it is in China, businesses just look at that and they say, if we're a big user of electricity, we cannot afford to stay in Britain. And this has strategic implications. It means that vital manufacturers, not just the heavy manufacturers, but even lighter manufacturers, such as personal protective equipment. All of that had been transferred to China. We suddenly needed to protect ourselves against the Chinese virus. And we couldn't because we no longer had any manufacturing facility to do this because it had been priced out by electricity prices. Yeah. So these are the main reasons why I object to the windmills. It's not just the design <laughs> of the <laughs> it's the, it's the, it's the strategic implication of making our electricity disproportionately expensive. Mm. Yeah, that was quite a, <laughs> a long segue into the mining uh, rights and uh, Chinese communism. It was interesting, very interesting. I, I learned a lot there, um, Christopher. Um, just uh, so critics will mention that storage capacity, um, that perhaps in the future, um, you know, we can store the energy for future use um, 
in storage stations. But I mean, oh, and perhaps the, eggs might fly. <laughs> I, no, I mean the cost. Of cost and, uh, <laughs> if you're a small child, you can imagine pigs flying. <laughs> you know better. They weigh rather a lot, and they don't have terribly good wings. Indeed, they don't have wings at all. So no, they can't fly. And that's the problem with batteries. In order to have a battery, you have to have a very large capacity, and this is the problem even in something as small as a motor car. And the problem with batteries is that they depend on rare earth minerals, and the clue is in the name, rare earth. They are relatively rare, in fact lithium, which is one of them, is relatively common. But it's well distributed in such a way that if you mine it, you've got to mine it only in those places where it's concentrated. And concentrated, they've just found an enormous deposit in Nevada, for instance. But um, it's quite rare. And would you like to guess where one third of the world's lithium supply is? It's probably somewhere in Africa, isn't it? No, it's Western China and occupied oh. Tibet. <laughs> All right. Wow. Um, okay. <laughs> so now you begin to see <laughs> something. Of, now you see it through the strategic eyes through mm -hmm. which I see it. And you will see that I'm not some foaming at the mouth conspiracy theorist. I'm telling you it like it actually is mm -hmm. because I have the inside knowledge to do so. And I'm now old enough that I have the freedom to do so because everything that I was talking about, about the minor strike, is more than 30 years old. It's no longer classified. Mm. But um, the point is that this is, you know, communism is a real thing. Chinese communism with this fascist component, which is now being echoed in the West. You see it in the big tech giants, for instance. Mm. They mm. defer to the communists or the Democrats, as they call themselves in America, mm -hmm. and are therefore permitted to continue playing their silly games. And of course, they are now actively censoring the Republican Party, including even a sitting president. I mean, the most astonishing thing. Mm. And the Republican Party, you know, has just been lazy. I mean, the main reason why the courts wouldn't look at the electoral frauds, which were enormous in the last American election, mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. and some absolutely horrifying things went on, and they went on on very much a large enough scale. Yeah, well, it's, log it's logic it's as well. If anybody's been following elections from the year dot, I mean, the, the turnout was, in some of the places, was just unbelievable, like a huge well, high, tur high turnouts. <laughs> yes. you know? yeah. All those dead people. <laughs> if you, if you, you, someone was making, the, making uh, the point that if you got that in somewhere like Afghanistan or Syria, like for Assad in Syria, he gets something like 90% turnout, you know? <laughs> yeah, um, so. no, that's right. I mean, uh, clearly it was it was rigged, but the courts wouldn't look at it. Now, the Supreme Court wouldn't look at it because Mr. Justice Roberts is now a lefty. He wasn't when he was appointed. He moved to the left. Yeah. And he is also frit. He was frightened that if they heard any of these cases and gave them any credence, the Supreme Court would be subjected to violent attacks by the left-wing mob, um, which indeed was what uh, attacked the Capitol. That was <laughs> the the actual breaching of the Capitol was done by Antifa. Mm. And then a lot of rather stupid Republicans um, followed them in, um, but it was it was done by agents provocateurs to a very large, not completely by them, but to a very large extent. So the uh, the voting systems. Um, oh. I don't know whether you come across this, but the, 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 they use voting machines, which, of course, you should never do because machines can so easily be tampered with. And they use them right across America, particularly in the swing states, which are the ones that the, the voter frauds were concentrated on. Mm -hmm. And that the Dominion Voting Machines Company, which is what they were using, had $400 million put into it by, guess what, China mm -hmm. one month before the election. Mm. Go figure. You know, there's lots of lots of evidence of this, but it really goes to your point that what is happening here is that they are moving in now on the upper echelons of government, both nationally and internationally. Mm -hmm. The Chinese, of course, control completely the World Health Organization. Yeah. Um, Gebrea says, useless, useless bureaucrat. He was a minister 
in the communist government in Ethiopia, which yes. is China. <laughs> and yes. and he was China's nominee for the job. And mm. so when this thing first broke out, did the World Health Organization say, please don't fly to China? Because, of course, that's what you should say when, when the thing like this first breaks out. You contain it mm. before it gets boots on. No. They said precisely the opposite. They said there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't travel to China. Mm. Now, why would they say that if their real job was, a, was to be a World Health Organization? Mm. There's no way they'd have said that. But they said it over and over and over and over again. Jabrea says on a dozen occasions. Went um, on at every public opportunity he had in in uh, December and January of, la of, of uh, the year back. Yeah, well, absolutely. But he should have been gone a long time ago, especially after he's. Of course, if, if Zimbabwe. Way. Like, remember, you, didn't he give um, Mugabe a special reception in the W WHO? Oh, oh, <laughs> because Mugabe was communist. They all stick <laughs> but and, it, then, uh, and his deputy. His deputy for emergencies is a guy called Ryan, and he is an Irish. Yes, I know, yeah. And he was at the Munich Security Conference, which I follow for various professional reasons with more than passing interest, in 2020. It always happens in, in sort of March time. It was about 15th of March. And he spoke at that conference in the presence of the foreign minister of China, who was sitting, watching him like a hawk. And he made a great speech about how the Chinese had been completely open and transparent, and it was wonderful how they'd cooperated with the World Health Organization, and how they were, of course, um, facilitating the World Health Organization's access to, to help them to work out what was going on. And, of course, the Chinese couldn't be blamed for any of this. It was the most head-bangingly deferential speech by one communist to another. And this is a big problem because the Chinese, having worked out that you can print money without uh, getting inflation, if you make sure that the money is printed in a currency which is loosely linked to your own, but isn't actually your own currency. That's the renminbi is the one they do this with. They have two currencies. They have the yuan, which is in daily circulation, which you will have used most of the time, and the renminbi, which they largely use for lending to other countries. And because the link between the two is sufficiently distant, they can lend renminbi in any amount. So they just press a button and print them and lend them to Britain. Costs nothing to China. And Britain immediately acquires an enormous financial obligation that China has done absolutely nothing to earn. Hmm. And that's why, you know, we have just been so stupid not understanding. Because you know, average politicians understand nothing about that. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So we were taken in completely. <laughs> um, okay. So the Chinese are up to all these, the yeah. gay. And Chris, I mean, we're speaking about... Um, world leaders, I mean, Angela Merkel and her um, interesting past in former East Germany, um, it's kind of interesting what the way Germany is being directed, considering you have, they're putting an awful lot of money and resources into renewable energies, or as you say, unreliable energies, I think that's very good. Um, unreliable, yes. I was there last year at the request of the Alternative für Deutschland, yeah. which is described by the BBC as a far-right party, whereas the communists are always described as a centre party in the BBC's language. Um, and I went to see them and met uh, their energy spokesman, Herr Carsten Hilze, who is a formidable mind and has seen right through the global warming claptrap. Um, and he was full of how the, uh, the CDU, which is the German uh, Christian Democrat Union, which uh, Merkel leads, has sold itself to this, essentially this communist um, nonsense of, of global warming. And yes, uh, I was once operated on by a German surgeon who, uh, like me, had done some time on the fringes of intelligence and therefore knew how to analyze this stuff. And he was very interesting about her. The um, Germans, um, Sicherheitsdienst uh, had done quite a number on her and had found that indeed uh, her sympathies lay quite strongly with the communist way of thinking. And he put it 
I think rather more strongly than I would, but then he had much more knowledge than I did. He, he said that he thought that they were very happy, let's put it this way, that, that, uh, that she was where she was. Um, so, yes, she has bought into this rubbish in the same way as Boris Johnson has. Mm -hmm. And Boris Johnson, of course, um, we have a wonderfully rude word, which I can't use, which describes somebody who is misled by who he happens to be sleeping with to uh, adopt a policy he wouldn't have ever yeah. adopted in the light of day. Uh, I won't use the word, but you know what it is, and yeah. that's what he is. And it's, it's desperately sad because he is bright enough to see through this rubbish, except in one respect. And this is a big problem which the communists have ruthlessly exploited. It is that in the West, we are in our governing class almost entirely scientifically illiterate even the simplest equation and your average minister will run five miles in the british cabinet at the moment there is one kind of halfway literate uh, minister in mathematical terms and that's rishi sunak who made an absolute fortune in the city before going into government the same could be said to, to a lesser extent of jacob reese mogg who also did very well in the city but neither of them has any understanding of physics, for instance. Any, other, I mean, none whatsoever. And this is a huge problem. Boris, of course, who was trained as I was in the classics, didn't do what I did and do some additional studies in mathematics and in physics, so as to be up to speed on questions like the global warming thing. Mm. And so it's very easy for people like him to be swayed by determined partisans pushing this party line that we have to shut down the capitalist West because otherwise the planet will burn to a crisp. I've actually seen it put in those terms. I was debating at uh, Trinity College Dublin on this a few years ago, and my opponent was an Irish communist, of course, they nearly always are, and he actually showed a piece of toast. He said, this is what the Earth is going to look like as we go on. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and so wherever you go, uh, you know, this, this has infected uh, journalism, it's infected politics, mm. it, uh, you know, the, the head of our central bank is pathetic yeah. about moaning well, on about how companies should make provision against climate risk, absolute nonsense. And of course, the moment he left the bank, he was recruited by yet another communist front group to head up its climate initiative. Yeah, um, well, it's absolutely well, astonishing how they've all worked themselves up into a lather over this. And that, I hope, will bring us on to why the whole thing is nonsense. Yeah, well, I just wanted to just to finally in Germany, as you, you don't have to get much into the science. I mean, it's basic logic. I mean, if, if Germany is putting so much investment into renew, renewables that are not very reliable, and then at the same time closing down their nuclear power stations, hopefully they expect by 2022, um, and they're setting up Nord Stream to get natural gas from Russia. They're importing coal from Poland while closing down their own coal stations and, and nuclear power from France. So, yes, they might have the green energy box ticked, but it's kind of cheating when they're expecting other countries to increase their... They uh, are exporting you know. their emissions, is the phrase the left yeah. uses on this. They're exporting their emissions elsewhere. Of course they are. And that, of course, is the whole point. You export your emissions to communist countries. <laughs> yes. And they get business. <laughs> That's what it's for. I mean, if one looks at the... If, if one looks at the uh, this is why you begin to see the strategic picture now, but if, if, you, if you look at... Uh, <laughs> The uh, the Paris Accords, for instance. Now, until Biden rejoined the Paris Accords, 90 percent of the world's emissions were exempt from any obligation under the Paris Accords. That's how silly they are. Now it's 80 percent because America has rejoined. Mm. But four fifths of all the world's emissions are exempt from the Paris Accords. If you look at where all the new emissions are coming from, they're coming from what is delicately called on the BP map of this, East Asia. Mm. And that's the code word for China. Mm. China, it now accounts for something like two thirds of all new emissions. I mean, absolutely staggering. And of course, the left are busy saying, of course, China is adopting windmills and solar panels. No, they're not. They're building them for us and making a vast 
profit in doing so, but they yeah. don't use them themselves. They've got a few in places where tourists might see them, but they're building coal-fired power stations, one or two new ones every week under their latest five-year plan, which now says they're going to go on doing that until 2060. <laughs> yes. so it doesn't matter what we do. Uh, and I therefore, see. look at the accumulated <laughs> greenhouse gas <laughs> index produced by, by NOAA. Um, which is uh, what is the radiative forcing from all of mankind's greenhouse gas activities. It doesn't include things like land use change, but it is the greenhouse gases. It's been going up in an absolute, more or less exactly a straight line for the last 25 years. There's all this talk about, oh, global warming, we must shut down this, shut down that. It has made absolutely no difference. The uh, emissions have gone up. The radiative forcing have gone up in a straight line every other thing. No downturn, not even a slowing. And why? Because very nearly all the countries on Earth and all the com communist countries without exception are simply exempt from making any restrictions. So the West is shooting itself in the foot way to run a sustainable um, economy is capitalism. It's extremely efficient at the allocation of resources and at repricing things as circumstances change. You don't need governments to sit there and tell people how to do it. Capitalism does it better. Well, but nobody's arguing for this anymore. This is the big, again, a strategic impact of this climate nonsense, is that here is Boris Johnson, the Conservative Party wholesale, adopting outright communistic approaches to the economy. Now, with COVID, you understand they're going to have to be a bit of counter-cyclical money printing and so forth. That's understood. But this global warming stuff, there is no legitimate excuse for that. Yeah. They are effectively shutting down capitalism, which yeah. may yet survive this global warming nonsense, unless we can persuade people to look properly at the okay. science. So is the world getting warmer or not? And um, so the world is getting warmer, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And neither the absolute temperature nor the rate at which it is getting warmer is unprecedented. So let's deal first of all with the absolute temperature. Now you're too young to remember this, but if you go back ten thousand years, I remember this well. <laughs> there was. Um, a warm period that with one little dip in the middle lasted until 4,000 years ago, so 6,000 years, mm -hmm. during most of which global temperature on average was at or above today's temperature. Mm -hmm. And in one or two uh, points during that period, quite a bit above today's temperature. And the world didn't fry. Mm -hmm. Then uh, there was a little ice age. I say little. It was a much. It was a big ice age, or the end of the last ice age, which was about ten thousand years ago. Things got um, it began it began warming up after the previous ice age. Then um, there was another warm period. This was the Minoan warm period, named after the civilization of ancient Crete, which flourished until the eruption of Santorini. Uh, which caused the ten plagues of Egypt and destroyed the Minoan civilization, which was in the firing line of that volcano. And then there was the Egyptian Old Kingdom warm period, which was warmer than the present, the Roman warm period, which was warmer than the present, the medieval warm period, which was at least as warm as the present in all regions of the world except one, and that is Australia, which hadn't been discovered, so we don't know. But everywhere else, it was warmer than the present in the medieval warm period. And there are, I can literally cite hundreds of papers that establish this. Mm. So that, that deals with the absolute temperature. Um, uh, today's if, temperature can, is, is not exceptional. Now the rate of change in temperature, that's okay. the other thing. At the moment they realize they can't claim that the absolute temperature is hotter than it was before. They say, ah, oh, but it's the rate of change that is so damaging and so threatening and blah, 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 tipping points, this and that. Well, the answer to that is very simple. And that is, what is the oldest um, regional temperature record? And the answer is the central England temperature record. It actually covers very nearly all of England. And it goes back to 1659. Mm -hmm. And from 1694 until 1733, 
a period of 40 years. The world warmed, or at least central England warmed, and it's not a bad proxy for how the world warms, at a rate uh, equivalent to 4.33 Celsius degrees per century. Now, the world has been warming at one degree in 170 years, in the last 170 years. You know, the central England record, which has been much tampered with to try and increase the warming of recent years, is shown as warming at an equivalent of 2.9 degrees per century over the last 40 years. But 2.9 degrees per century is a lot less than 4.3 degrees per century. So the rate of warming isn't unprecedented either. Mm. Mm. So, so far, all that we have seen is within, and therefore not in the scientific sense, formally distinguishable from natural variability in yeah. the climate. Chris, sir, and recently, if, if someone wanted, yes? I mean, uh, I mean, there are uh, you know, irrefutable facts, I guess. I mean, if someone wanted to check them as a lay person online, and check you find clear. it very, very hard because until really? I began <laughs> uploading data and I wrote a program to calculate the least squares trend on the data so I could see how what the rate of warming actually was, nobody was doing this. And they weren't doing it because it wasn't showing very much warming. It still isn't. And so it was very difficult to get these records. Mm. And that's why I decided I just better sit down and read. It took me two weeks. I wrote a program that would download the data from I use four different um, data sets. I use the, the GIS and the um, NOAA data sets mm -hmm. and the Hadgrid set. Actually, I use three of the of the surface ones and then the two satellite ones, which are for the uh, bulk measurement of the lower troposphere. And I use UAH and RSS. So I can analyze any of those. And the Central England record I do as a separate thing. And the program will handle all of those and all the different data formats and it knows how they are and it adjusts them and they keep changing the formats. It's a nightmare keeping it up to date, but it doesn't enable me to do these calculations. And therefore, when I give you these figures, they are okay. accurate. Figures. But uh, even, have even in scientific with, papers, it, and so we, you know, nobody's, even, qu nobody's queried them. Even with regards to Central England temperature records, I mean, they will be recorded um, um, and would be, I guess someone could check them online and some... Well, I mean, you can download the same data I did. It takes okay, some time. Okay, so, so where, where, okay, so the data, I'm just curious where, like if I wanted to check that myself, I mean. Well, you'd, you'd have to go to the, the, the University of East Anglia, which is where they think. <laughs> okay. And okay. Oh, um, yeah. I had to recently, because the Hadcrute, which is the combined Hadley Center Ocean Record and, and the, the okay. climate research unit at East Anglia keeps the, the terrestrial global record. I had to ask uh, Crutem, to give me access okay. <laughs> to Hadcrute 5, which is the latest version of Hadcrute, where they get again depressed the, the temperatures. They were trying the to say, you don't, you don't want to see this. You don't want to see wrong. this. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not saying that or not such a tampering is justified. Uh, all I am saying is that we're really not in the Anthropocene, we're in the Adjustocene. A no. very large fraction of the global warming that is reported comes from these ex post facto yeah. adjustments. So uh, I, I'm somewhat cynical. I know they can always produce uh, yeah. excuses for this, but my approach is this. I simply say, OK, so you're saying that this is actually the slope. All right, I'll just ride with it and I'll see what happens if I do the sums on the basis of that. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things you can do, once you've established how fast it's actually warming, and uh, to give you the, how it's changed, they said in the Hadcrute 4 data set that from 1850 until 2020, which is 171 years, uh, the rate of warming equivalent per century is naught point no so the, the actual rate of warming the total warming over the period was naught point nine celsius over 170 years not much to worry about there as you might think well now they've revised that to 1.04 celsius over the period just by altering the, the data from the past to suit yeah the well, keep pushing it back or forward whatever they want 
always saying, oh, yeah, they always produce the most elaborate explanations of why they think this is justified. And some of them I buy, most of them I don't. But the point is, I just use yeah. their data because the approach that my team takes in, in looking at this whole question of how much warming are we going to cause, which is the, the question of what's called climate sensitivity, is I simply say, right, what we'll do is we will apply a technique known to logicians as Socratic Elenchus. And the way this works is invented by Socrates in ancient Greece. And the way it works is that the other side are putting forward a proposition. Their proposition is that the world is going to warm at a rate over the next century of somewhere between four, you know, I think it's three and eight Celsius. Eight. Yes, I know that. Uh, some, and 10 Celsius, some of the more extreme <laughs> things. But they're, they're kind of central estimate. Roughly speaking, the warming you would expect from all man made causes over the next 100 years is about the same as the warming you would expect if we doubled the CO2 content of the atmosphere and did nothing else but that. So, the what is called equilibrium CO2 sensitivity, or ECS, is the standard metric which is used by uh, climate science to work out how much warming we may cause. And the, the figure for ECS is about the figure for the amount of warming we can expect to cause this century. And the official current estimate, current predictions by the sixth generation models of the coupled model intercomparison project is that there will be between two and 5.7 Celsius of warming if we double CO2 and therefore this century, the two being about the same forcing. And the best estimate, they say, is 3.7 Celsius. Now, when uh, the Charney report was first produced in 1979, they said, well, it'll be three Celsius per doubling. They actually said two and a half, and that, of course, wasn't enough to frighten anyone, so they bumped it up to three in the final draft of the report. But if you look at their calculations, you'd see they knew it, was, it couldn't be more than two and a half, however hard you stretched it. So they bumped it up again to 3.7. That's now the mid-range estimate, 3.9, according to some groups of these different models that they use. So, you know, that's a lot. It's enough possibly to cause a little bit of concern. It's certainly not enough to go to the sort of pathetic panic that's happened around the world if that were right. Mm -hmm. So what my team decided to do is to see whether it was right. And it turns out that you don't need these vast climate models if all you want to know is how much warming would be caused by us doubling the CO2 concentration in the air. It turns out to be a strikingly simple calculation. We've spent years refining it so that it is simple, but also so that anyone looking at it, although they look first be horrified that it could possibly be as easy as this, they will recognize that it's going to get you very much into the right ballpark. There isn't a lot wrong with our method. It doesn't actually leave out any complexity that ought to be included. And you can actually calculate this equilibrium climate sensitivity, which they say at mid-range 3.7 Celsius, you can actually calculate it with only five parameters. All you need to know is, let us take the period from 1970 to 2020. It's a good period to take because they're all busy updating all the data for the 2021 um, next, you know, the sixth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So all the papers are being hastily updated. So we have all the latest data. And all you need to know is the total radiative forcing, which is the change in the net down minus up radiation knocking around at the top of the atmosphere caused by us. You need to know how much that is. And it's 3.2 watts per square meter over the last 170 years. That's their figure, not mine. We're using their figures all the way through here. So you need to know that. Then you need to know how much warming there was over that period. Well, we the only record that goes back to 1850 is the Hadcrew record, the British record. 
which is a global record. And there's a distinction between that and the Central England record. The, the Hadcote record is a global record. It's the only one that goes back to 1850. And we use their figure of 1.04 Celsius of warming over the period. How do we calculate that? We calculate it from the jigglings up and down of the data by doing what's called a least squares linear regression trend analysis. My computer has been taught by me to do these automatically, to take the data and instantly display and, and tell you what the figure is and so forth. So we know that that's what is 1.04 Celsius. That is their data. And we're using their method of analyzing it because Professor Jones, who used to keep that data set, said that if you want to analyze this and get the trend, the simplest way to do it and the most reliable is the least squares linear regression trend. So we're using his data and we're using his method to determine how much warming that it means. So that's that. Then you have to know how much of the warming hasn't yet, how much of the forcing, which is in watts per square meter of this extra radiation, has not yet come through in warming. Now, how on earth do we know that? We know that because there is what's called a radiative imbalance. There's more radiation coming in than is going out. And that means that the temperature has not yet risen to the point where the two are equalized. Mm -hmm. And you have to allow for that. So uh, I again use the latest trigger came out just earlier this year by the team that the IPCC is going to rely on, Shukman et al. And they say that that radiative imbalance is 0.87 watts per square meter. So we just say, we're not going to argue with their figure. We think it's way too high, but we will use their figure. Okay. So we use that. And then you do a simple calculation using those figures, and that will tell you how much warming um, we would have caused just on our own, provided you know how much of the warming that has happened over the last 170 years was caused by us. And there's a paper that came out just last in 2019 by Wu et al. And one of the authors of that was Jared Meal, who's right at the heart of the IPCC process. So this is mainstream science again. And he says that only 70% of that 1.04 Celsius of warming is actually caused by us. And the rest is just natural variability mm -hmm. in the climate. So again, we take their figure. Mm. And with those four figures, you can work out how much warming we would have caused on our own had all of that warming come through and allowing for the fact that 70% of what has come through is us. And that turns out to be, I think, just under one Celsius was mm. caused. And that would, that once the climate had fully settled down and the radiation was in balance again, that's how much it would be. Mm. So then you can take that one Celsius, divide it by the 3.2 watts per square meter of radiative forcing that we caused that warming with. And that tells you the unit anthropogenic warming per watt per square meter of anthropogenic forcing. Once you know that figure, all you need to know then is the anthropogenic forcing per doubling of CO2, and we use their figure from the latest generation of the model, which is 3.52 watts per square meter. You multiply that by that unit warming by mankind uh, per watt per square meter of anthropogenic radiative forcing, and bingo, you get the answer which is we're going to, at uh, the mid-range estimate of the warming on doubling of CO2 using their data and their methods comes out at just one Celsius degree, okay. not 3.7. So their central estimate is easily demonstrable by that calculation I've just done in front of you in my head. It's so easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if that the answer is we can expect one Celsius degree of warming. Now, as you can imagine, I wouldn't say this with that confidence if I had sat down and worked this out by myself. Mm. When I realized the world wasn't warming at the rate they predicted, I gathered a team of scientists around me. We had two questions. One is, you know, how much warming are we going to cause? But the other is, why do they think it's going to be as big as it is? Mm. There must be a mistake somewhere, because in 1990, the IPCC predicted that there would be 
a warming of, oh, equivalent to three times what it has been since 1990, 1990 to 2020, they, they predicted a certain rate of warming. And the rate of warming that's actually happened is one third of what they said it would be. And we saw this and we thought, well, now they must have got something wrong because they were confidently predicting mm -hmm. how much warming it was going to cause. And yet that confident prediction has turned out to be three times too big. So we, we, we thought, where is the error? So we found the error. It's absolutely fascinating. They forgot the sun was shining. OK, Christopher, I just want to thank you for your time today. Um, it was really great. And um, I learned a lot as well. And um, um, I'll leave a link to the website that you mentioned and um, a link to all the information so people can check it in their own time as well. Um, I'm sorry about the, the background noise the last few minutes. Um, but, no, uh, that's music in my ears. <laughs> so it's been a great pleasure. I hope you find something useful out of this. It's rather chaotic, but uh, we got there in the end. We got there in the end, yeah. Okay, Chris, thank you very much and enjoy the rest the of the week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Many bye. thanks. Bye.